So I'm, I'm going to start out by actually prefacing everything I said, but today you, uh, I'm going to congratulate you because you apparently just got like 706 Goya nominations. 13, 13, just 13. So congratulations on that. So maybe I should go, I, I'm going to, well, I, why don't you introduce everybody? What I'm going to introduce name? James Gray, one of the best Woo! Now, Now, <laughs> we have Roberto Canessa. He's uh, one of the survivors. We have Enzo Bogrinsic, who is playing Numa in the film. Uh, excellent interpreter. Translator, Norma. And we have our cinematographer, Pedro Luque. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use my phone so I can remember everybody. You I know. Yes. Yeah, for about how many years? Many years. Um, I want to start out by asking you about uh, something that I think is uh, really fabulous about the movie, among many things, which is the POV and how you handle the point of view. Because you got essentially a narrator from the dead. And it's not like Sunset Boulevard where it starts off and you see it and all that. This is a very uh, interesting, I don't think I've ever seen it, where somebody starts narrating the film and then the, they die, what, two-thirds of the way in? Yeah. Can you talk about that decision and what it means? I, I have my own theory, which of course, me being a bloviator, I'm going to tell everybody, but I want to know what you think. Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I think that you cannot limit the adaptation of a, of a, of a true story to the fact. You, there's, there's, there, there, you need to add like, like an interpretation, you need to add like an aesthetic to it. Uh, so uh, we struggle a lot in, in writing the script because every time we 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 wrote the, we wrote the story it Who's was we? Uh, the f the the we had like a group of three writers with me the very the very early drafts it felt like the other films because it was all about dialogue and action dialogue and action we needed an interpretation and then um i thought about this character numa who who is uh, so well remembered by by his colleagues uh, and he is remembered to 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 be almost like 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 the example of what to, what what is the excellence of, of in the mountain, you know, and he died ten days before the rescue, uh, which raises a very interesting question, you know, like what's the meaning of for that? I mean, we always in these kind of stories of heroism, the one who does the best is the one who gets the reward, not in the case of Numa, and then I thought that um, by doing so, I, I was. Uh, by telling the story through through Numa, I was some kind touching what I really like about the book, uh, Society of the Snow, which was written 35 years after the plane crash. So you can you it's it's a more spiritual, even philosophical approach to what happened because it has the the gravitas of the time that had passed, and and I, I thought by doing so by telling the story through the eyes of a dead guy, I was touching that spiritual layer that I love from, from, from the book. And also, I, I thought that I was given the chance, that. I was given the chance of what basically happened in the mountain is people, people giving everything they had to, to, to the other one. It's to me, the, the, it's the, um, the way they, they were giving their, their, their everything the support the, the the animal and the body to the other ones it, it's uh, to me is to it's to understand that you and the other one are the same thing you know it's the the uh, they were doing the, doing that unconsciously is the the unconscious realization that you and I are the same thing and I was allowed in the audience to experience death which is that thing that always Alfred Hitchcock says you cannot kill the protagonist because the people will feel cheated yeah. but in that situation people were dying so basically what we're doing is doing the, the visual metaphor of killing the audience, experience death, and then allowing the audience to keep the story through all the characters, which was basically what, what these people was doing. Yeah. Well, I, it, uh, it's more or less in line with what I, what I was thinking, which is that it, it gives the film a kind of religiosity, if I may sound pretentious, because 
what happens is, is it becomes a myth of the gods, not just a myth of man. He's coming back from the dead to talk with you. And so the film embraces their religiosity because religion is such a key aspect in their souls. Mm. Um, uh, that, was, that was, to me, the, 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 the complexity on Numa, is that he's a myth on the excellence. Yeah. You know? But you couldn't be excellent in the mountain. Yeah. The group was excellent. But when you go to the particular, when you go to the individuals, they, each of them measure the energy differently. And they had to deal with with their with with their shadows, you know. So in it's in in the individuals where you find that people that maybe did didn't do that much survive, and people who did a lot uh, didn't make it. So that's why I'm using all the time this kind of visual metaphor of Numa getting blinded by the light because that's his problem. That is all about light. Numa is all about light, and people is light and shadow. We are we are people with faults. We are people uh, with we are complex people. Yeah. And and when 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 you talk to the survivors, when I talk to Roberto about, and the other ones about Numa, he was uh, uh, almost a myth of what is what, of of the excellence. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's also uh, I I mean we're here for like nine minutes or something ridiculous. So I'm going to ask you one more question, unfortunately, and then you can do all the talking. But. Okay. Um, you got this ensemble, basically. It is an ensemble. Like I say, a myth of the gods, but it's an ensemble. And yet it's done very subjectively, which is very strange, very unusual, right? Usually you see, and it's an ensemble, it, it's almost like you have a god's eye view. But you've handled a lot of the sequences, including with the use of sound, which I think is extraordinary, a very interior view. Does this make sense to you? Or can you explain this? Because I found that unusual and in a great way. I, I really wanted to make the audience feel like like an immersive experience to to get into the plane with them. So if you understand the context, if you will understand what they did, basically, is, is if you went through the same experience they went through. Th this happened in, in in the we did a screening for the families of the of, of the survivors, but also the families of the of the victims, and for the first time in fifty years, some of them understood how important were their brothers or or or, or, or the, the, their families for them to survive and it's because we 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 put people we put the audience into into that plane and also we wanted to give at least each character a moment you know i i see numa a little bit like like dorothy in in the wizard of oz because she's he's learning from all of them especially from the dead He's making a self, it's a journey of self-discovery, of understanding what is your true nature and accept it and being brave to, to, to be it. Uh, and he's a little bit like Dorothy. He, he's talking to all the characters and at the end he gets the conclusion that, okay, this is the right thing to do. And he delivers himself to the group. I, I do see the Judy Garland resemblance now that I'm assuming. Um, <laughs> So I, I, I have to ask this question of Roberto because he's sitting here. I mean, it's such a basic question, but what does it feel like to see this movie for you? What does it feel like? Is it cathartic, thrilling, horrifying, maybe everything? What does it feel like? This is the second time I see the movie, and I was completely moved today. And to the people in the audience, I don't know if many times you have experienced what you experienced today in this movie. How is something, a story that is unbelievable, was made believable by the magic of Jota. And I see that the actors suffered in a way what we suffered in the mountains. I mean, this is a story a lot about suffering. You see them suffer. I see... In Numa, how he was suffering there. So I believe that probably would be a long time until you get so moved. And I tell you because I was there. And when I see them, how they felt their experience, although they were not us, in their way, they climbed the mountain. And I think that's, that's a masterpiece of, of the film done, done today. So uh, along those lines, Enzo, I, do you, 
when you're playing a, you know, a real person, you haven't met the person, you don't know the person, how much of a debt do you think you owe an idea of the reality of that person? Or is it your own idea completely? Good luck. In this case, normally the characters empiezan lejos de uno y se van acercando o uno se va acercando. En este caso, el personaje es tan humano, es tan real, que uno siempre está en una especie de deuda. Uno siempre sabe que esa persona existió y que esa persona pasó por eso que vos vas a, a intentar hacer. Durante el rodaje, todo el tiempo, la historia real te está jugando. Todo el tiempo sentís la realidad de la historia y te conmueve, sentís el peso de las cosas que pasaron y que la, la responsabilidad de hacerlas. Durante muchos momentos, y fue de las primeras veces en mi vida que esto me pasó, durante muchos momentos toqué emociones reales, aparecían. Estaba en distintas escenas, como la avalancha, por ejemplo, y la angustia aparece, una angustia que... No sé de dónde viene, pero me tomaba por completo y, y me hacía muy difícil seguir adelante. Pero como había, había que seguir. De alguna manera, yo pienso que para contar esta historia era muy difícil no pasar por sufrimiento. Creo que no hay manera para contar esto si uno no pasa un poco por ese sufrimiento, si no lo atraviesa. Y sí, ese peso está constantemente, incluso hasta el día de hoy. I said yes. Uh, Here we are. She's well, amazing. <laughs> well, usually characters start very far away from you, and then you start getting close to them. And in this case, we it felt real because it was a real person, and we felt and we owed them a debt. And the only way to do this is to live what they lived through, and you know feel that suffering. So when we and when we were filming, we felt the reality. We felt the weight of what they lived and also a responsibility of what that carried. And there were many moments that I lived through in this film, but this was actually the first time in my life that while filming, I felt the real emotion coming through me. Like in the case of the avalanche, like I felt the real sense of distress like taking over me. And But I had to be, keep going because we had to continue filming. and. Um, You know, this is the type of story that it's impossible to tell without going through that suffering. We have to go through that and also feel the weight of all of that. I suppose this is the perfect segue to Mr. Cinematographer. Hello, Pedro Luque. Hello. Um, So because this evening is all about me, you understand, I can tell you that uh, I shot a movie in the jungle, which was very agonizing, and I had, I think, two days in the snow-capped mountains. <laughs> and the snow-capped mountains led the jungle for difficulty by a mile. <laughs> I want you to talk me through this, brother. You got up there, you know, digital, you right? Uh -huh. You were with digital. Do you, you, you have a technician there with you with this board and the whole thing or her board? I, there, I, you well, got to talk me through how you did this. It was, I mean, it was a, it was a difficult thing. It was my fourth movie in the snow, basically. But I can't believe it because I'm from Uruguay and uh, suddenly I, <laughs> I found myself again in the snow. But this I, 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 time I was like a, a trip. 140 days of shooting in the, and um, and it was. Very difficult, but just got get to the set. You know, it took us like a 20 minute ride in a gondola and a 45 minute ride in a tractor, basically. And um, and yeah, snow makes everything slow. You know, we had the altitude. We didn't have you know like warm food. They didn't have food at all. We had some. Uh, and um, but the thing is, like it's it, technically it was really complex. This movie, so it has a lot of techniques mixed together because we have we had a stage, we had LED screens, but also we had 
most of the movie shot in a real exterior in the snow, and also we we had all the back all the backgrounds you see are real footage from the real Andes mountains where they were. They they were, they were amazed that the looks you see when you get into the, um, on, on the scenes on the where where, where you when you are in uh, around the plane, it's exactly what they saw. And I think the the um, the technical complexity it was something that. Uh, we dealt with it day by day, and then we had to deal with the other difficulties of, like you know, like being in the snow, being in the altitude. You were asking me, like, uh, how did I smoke <laughs> up there? Uh, and uh, I quit. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, but it was it was it was a pain in the ass. Yeah. Well, I, the, the, my my memory of my whopping two days was that uh, the lenses kept. Getting foggy and freezing over the yeah. movement was that was my biggest yeah. issue. I don't see how you manage this for a hundred. Well, well, how many days? A hundred thousand days? Well, how many? A hundred thousand. A hundred and forty. Uh, we lost count after a hundred forty-three, <laughs> right? Uh, so uh, some people say hundred and fifty. Some people say hundred and forty-seven. So how no, many? Because we actually we actually went through the to the same place where the plane crashed and we shot there for twenty days. Yeah, and we don't we don't, we don't count, count that those days because yeah. basically we're background. Yeah, um, I mean basically technically we had to turn on the cameras inside a place that has that wasn't so freezing, so the cameras will turn on there and then take them out, and then the lenses will have to be cold already, so they were right kept cold. The thing with the lenses, is you, we couldn't like bring cold lenses to a warm place because they would like uh, fog and freeze, and it was a mess. But in the avalanche. Like that was a stage, but it was real snow and it was cold because we had air conditioning in our stage that was at top of the mountain, and uh, and the, the 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 camera operators would have you know like napkins in their in their pockets and they would like be cleaning and clean that thing and then they were cleaning and taking their hand out and they were like crawling in the snow, uh, yeah. and then bags you know bags so the snow doesn't get inside the camera. But uh, I, I have to ask this a bit of a nerd question. Forgive me, guys. But uh, it, it, I couldn't, it's not, usually I can tell. I couldn't tell whether it was digital or film. It looked kind of like film, but it, I was not, quite, I couldn't figure out what yeah. you Yeah, it's I, again, it's a mixture of techniques, right? But uh, it, it's basically digital. It was kind of under, underexposed a little bit. And, uh, and then it was, after we finished the whole movie, after we had the VFX, after we had color, we printed the movie on film, and then gave us that gave us you know not only the grain but also a, a better blending of the VFX, you know, a different like texture to everything, and a little bit of a shift of colors and right. some help with the highlights, awesome. and that that we scanned it back. So yeah, it's a mixture of a lot of techniques. Yeah, uh, hence my befuddlement. <laughs> Um, I want to, this is not a question, but you can respond, and I hope you do. You're a very erudite man. So I watched the film, and it has the single most hopeless moment I've ever seen in a movie, which is when they look out, and it looks endless. <laughs> you know the moment, of course. You made the picture. Why am I telling you? <laughs> Was and he was there. <laughs> it is it is one of the most hopeless moments in a movie yeah. about hope that I've I, I cannot it, it was I remember I watched it and my reaction was like it was it's devastating. And yet here it is. It's not a question. Uh, you can just talk about it because you're such a smart guy. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Uh, I, don't come out I, I want also to Roberto to talk about it because I, I interviewed the survivors for many, many, many hours to try to understand them and try to get the details. To, I was obsessed with detail and, and small gestures because being a film that has a story that has been shot twice already before this one, I was trying to get uh, through the scenes from different from different from a different angle to make them look different and had a different also meaning. And I remember that to me that moment was the realization that the plan was wrong, that they were wrong. So basically they they they, they spend the whole film talking about what should we do and suddenly when they decide to do this idea of going to uh, to the east, they were wrong. Mm -hmm. And and 
I envisioned that moment like a moment of calm, like being very calm, because at that moment they they know they're dead. So if you have lost any hope, if you have that, as you said, that hopeless moment, suddenly you don't fight. You don't need to fight. It's okay, we're dead, and and then they have a beautiful conversation. Yeah. They talk about the view. Uh, they talk about he's he's the one saying such a shame that we are we are already dead, right? How how do you, how do you see? Because it was not like that, right? That the moment. Um, there are moments in your life in which your brain must be stronger than your feelings. It's a, a brain problem. I knew we knew that to the west was Chile, someplace. By the map, couldn't be more than 70 kilometers. So if we could walk in, in that direction, someplace we will get out of the mountain. So there was a conviction. When we saw the mountains, we realized that uh, it going, was going to be harder than what he thought. And then, and none the short-sighted, but I could see two roads on the Argentinian side. And I told them, Nando, we are going the wrong way. We should go the other way. And then uh, I don't see any road. And we knew by the map that the, on the Argentinian side was more uh, desertic. And maybe we, we could find ourselves lost in a desert. So we had to counterbalance many of these aspects in that decision making. On the other hand, Nando wouldn't go he wouldn't go back. He, the, only, my only, the only chance was to go to, to the west. So the, and, uh, and he's Russian, and I am Italian. <laughs> so I said, tomorrow I will give you an answer. Because you shouldn't take the decisions on the evening because you're tired. You must wait for the next day. And on the next day was a spectacular day. The mountain, the, it had snowed. And you could see the, the, the powder snow that would be like the hair of a, of a woman that was moving around. Those days that you would swallow the world. And we and then they say, Nando, we had enough. We should go on. And we begin sliding on the other side for 200 or 300 meters. And then the, 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 the avalanches would be around. And I said, this is the mansion. I want to go home. But my home was in that direction. But but also to me, I, I I to me it's like your your first instinct when you when you play a moment like that is that they will start to argue, and to me it was a moment of agreement, because this to me Roberto and Nando they they are a very cinematic couple, you know. I I remember I, I was telling the, the actors Matias and and Agustin the example. You remember I don't know the name in English, but we had these Hanna Barbera cartoons. Roberto, it was they call uh, El Lagarto Juancho yeah. and El, El, El Leon Tristón. I don't know. It was a lizard and a lion. And all the time are like running in the cartoons. And are all the time are, 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 are yeah, exactly. And all the time are, are, are arguing each other. It's like Don Quixote and Sancho Panza. It's like Captain Kirk and Dr. And Spock. They are, they are all the time arguing, but they don't, they don't realize, but they are the same person. They are they are two two halves of the first of the same person. So to me that was the moment that they are one at the top of that mountain. So they don't need to argue. They know they're dead. There's nothing else to argue. They just need to sit down and enjoy the view. And actually they they they, they spend a long time there. I did these three dissolves things that I copied from another film. I'm not going <laughs> to... I'm, I'm not going to tell you what film was that, but I... Uh, it's, you will never guess it. Uh, and it's a moment of... It's a peaceful moment. It's We're dead, okay? And and suddenly they are one. They, they stop arguing. For the first time in the film, they stop arguing. I want to know your relationship with your actors and how he talks to you and you talk to him. I, because this is a very, it's again a unique ex ex circumstance, right? You don't work on blocking very much. Okay, in this scene, you're sitting. I mean, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, 
what are you guys talking about? Or are you? Do, do, you, guys, do you leave your actors alone? What's the relationship like with, with Enzo? So, we, right. so it will be like a test. Okay. Like, like. <laughs> That's fine. Increíble, obvio. Eh, la verdad es que Justo es una persona que ensaya mucho, prepara mucho, pero en el set libera mucho también. Eh, improvisábamos mucho. Yo preparaba una escena el día anterior, la preparaba mucho. Llegaba a set. Estaba preparado para empezar la escena y caía Jota con unos papeles con la escena nueva que había escrito recién. Y tenía cinco minutos para leerla, un poco entender lo nuevo, conversabas, te daba indicaciones y empezábamos a rodar. Y escena tras escena siempre había una nueva dirección en la cual explorar, un nuevo matiz, una, nu una nueva óptica. Y eso te mantenía muy atento, te dejaba todo el tiempo expectante, estabas despierto constantemente. Y las indicaciones son de todo tipo. También teníamos coach, que pff, su trabajo es brutal. Y, y eran un puente espectacular entre J y nosotros, donde entendíamos mucho más lo que él estaba viendo, que estaba faltando, o lo que estaba viendo que, que era por ese camino pero hace un trabajo constante, uno se siente acompañado y al final termina siendo más fácil mi trabajo. Uh, incredible. Uh, in, tr uh, in truth, uh, Jota is a person that prepares a lot, that rehearses a lot, but then there is a lot of freedom uh, on the set. So we improvised a lot, and so what would happen, I would prepare a scene a lot the night before, prepare and prepare, and then next day come ready to film, and then we got handed new papers for the scene that Jota just wrote the night before. And we would talk for five minutes, get uh, directions, and ask any questions, and then we would begin filming. And doing this scene after scene, we discovered new perspectives and new nuances, Uh, in the work that we were doing. And um, this is the type of work that leaves you on your toes, expecting, awake. And um, the direction that we got was incredible. And we also had coaches that were amazing. And they acted as a bridge between Hota and us. And they helped us understand what was intended. They showed us the path and what was the vision uh, behind it. And this was... This work was a constant, and it was it's the type of work where you don't feel alone, and it was a wonderful way to work. I'm gonna I'm gonna feel now very very intellectual and arrogant. I'm gonna I'm gonna quote Jean -Luc, Jean Luc Godard. He has this famous line. He says the the shoot destroys the script. The, the editorial destroys the shoot, you know, which basically uh, it's a thought on that it's a constant search and it's a constant process. So when I change an idea on the day we are shooting, if I change an idea, it's not because I thought about it in that moment. It's the result of all the homework I've done until that moment. So you keep changing, all, thinking all the time, all the time. And then when, when you see the actor, you have the chance to react for the first time to what's, what's happening. You can see it. And in that moment, you can, you can, you can, you can take a, a, a different decision. That is, it will be not that different. It will be like one step beyond what was planned. Uh, so, and, and what I, 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 I love to work with actors. I really love to work with actors. I gave them all the information. I, we, we, we did like seven weeks of rehearsals. We went through all the film. Then I put them in contact with the, the survivors, in your case, with the family of Numa. And they, were, they, they, they established a relation. You, you were talking to the family of Numa during all the shoot. And, and then I, I like to provide them the, the context. So, so we, we were shooting in the snow. They were able to feel the, 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 the cold. They were going through a street diet. So they were experiencing also. And you try to suggest 
um, and create emotions similar to the ones you're watching on the screen. Of course, it will, not, it will never be the same, but for example, uh, one of, to me, one of the most beautiful memories is when we shot uh, the day that Numa dies. Because he was the, the protagonist, he was the lead actor. And because we were shooting chronologically, after so many days, uh, he was leaving the set. So all the actors knew that the, that was his last day. And you can tell by their faces that they were suffering for that. They were suffering because they would never see Enzo anymore. They, 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 they were going to be keep the shooting the film without him. Respectfully, I have to interrupt you and because I don't know, I'm sure this is a room full of filmmakers, but if whoever isn't, that is unbelievable what he just said. Shooting a movie in sequence is extremely rare, particularly a movie like this. It's beyond rare. That blows me away. You shot it in sequence. We have to lose weight, so we have to do Good it like God. that. <laughs> that is absolutely that's astonishing. Wow. You, it made it a lot harder because uh, <laughs> you can improvise, but not that much. And, uh, and when you shoot in the snow, it's always the mountain who's ruling the situation. We. We had three planes, remember, and we had to l check the weather forecast every day yeah. and decide what to shoot the day after because we were depending on the weather. And we were able to uh, adapt, but not that much because we were shooting chronologically. God almighty. Well, my question to you then would be, if you're, sh if you're shooting chronologically, 140 days of this thing, Shooting chronological, don't you lose your way at some point? <laughs> it sort of becomes like a kind of madness. I, I yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, but you have time to go right, you know? Yeah. yeah. No, it's I understand that. But are, are you editing as you're going, or are you one of those people yes. that just collect? You mm, are. Yeah. So then when you're giving him notes, it's on stuff you've, on the movie that you've assembled. Yeah. And since you're going, would you show, would you see this stuff? Some of the stuff I will see, uh, but I, I mean, it's, it's, it had the advantage that we can change a little bit some stuff because we were going forward. We didn't have to redo stuff, right? I mean, we were redoing some stuff that we thought I saw. Oh, yeah, we did that scene, and then, then we need, you know, second unit to like clean up the scene a little bit. But we could create it as we went because we were going chronologically. Like, so we didn't shoot the ending, and then we yeah, had to yeah. come back. So you're you're basically you went twice to the sort of civilized world so to speak, right, for the beginning and the end. That, and in between, you did that whole thing. It wasn't... He basically, we, no, we, we started the shoot uh, after the crash, yeah, right? I and see. then we shot all the whole thing, and then we went to Uruguay and shot the ending, right, the hospital and that stuff. Oh. Then we waited, uh, and, and they gained weight again, right? We waited like a month and a half, and they ate a lot, and they <laughs> became rugbyers. Oh. And then we shot the beginning. See. And then <clears throat> we shot the whole beginning, and then we had to build the whole crash, uh, the plane crash, uh, and then we went to Madrid and we shot that thing. So you're shooting the beginning essentially after everything. Yeah. But that was actually very good because after so much time together, yeah, they were you you can they tell the chemistry, the warmth, the, warmth. Yeah. the warmth, you know. But don't you have the undertow of a melancholy that you don't want because there it's <laughs> something that's already happened that shouldn't have, if that makes sense. You didn't feel that yeah. at all? Uruguay, Uruguay is pretty melancholic already, so uh, I think, yeah. Especially, yeah. Especially it's pretty dark, huh? Especially in the winter, yeah. In, yeah. yeah. It's a, it's a very, no, it was a very hard shoot. You know, the, the most difficult, to me, the most difficult part of the shoot every day was to step out of my bed because I knew that I had so much every day and we we were depending on the weather so so you could shoot a a, a a simple scene but then you will wake up and there was this day that we woke up and the whole mountain was orange because we had this wind from from the from the desert from the sahara dragging the sun and suddenly the, the yeah. mountain looked like orange. yeah it was literally like dunes suddenly i mean there's this wind that comes from the sahara uh, desert that brings dust and it snowed dust in the mountains and, and then we woke always, up one day and, and it was orange you, 
It's the first time in 20 years that, yeah, yeah, yeah okay, yeah, I know sure. that story is the first time in 20 years, yes. So, yeah, and that happens, and then, you know, we had to adapt. But luckily, that, I mean, it lasted a little bit. We went to shoot interiors, and we shot as much as we could, and at one point there was a big storm, and everything went white again. And, uh, but it was a little bit tricky because if, if you stepped in the snow, you know, there was a little layer of, like, of chocolate in the middle. <laughs> it was like an inverted Oreo. <laughs> well, um, unfortunately, I'm getting the, you know, the, 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 the sign, but I want to ask one quick question. One quick question because I do the two great, quick questions instead well, of you one got, quick no, question. You got to run. You got to go and run the screening I, after this, buddy. I don't want to. <laughs> I got nothing to do with that. I got nothing to do with that. Um, Giacchino's not here. We love Michael Giacchino. He's a great man. Yeah. Legendary composer already. He loves like, you too. He told me yesterday. All right. Well, I already liked him. Uh, <laughs> when you have music and when you don't, talk me through that decision process with him. That was very interesting because it, it was such an emotional journey. Like like every every scene was so emotional that he came with uh, with a lot of constraint, like like using silence and and what, basically like. It was the same thing with the sound with the sound design. Uh, it, it was like those painters that that work f uh, from a black canvas, not not the light, you know. So so, and the moment you add a, a, a single white dot is so meaningful, and the music is the same. Uh, actually, I, I I like so much his approach that I I I took a lot of his music once in the final mix because uh, it, it worked really well, and and he loved that. He was always like supporting my my ideas. Um, he 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 was very good in that. Like like the good thing about Michael is not, is he's, he's a, gr a great musician, but he's an even a better storyteller. Yes, we, I know Michael since like f f fifteen years ago. We, he came to a film music festival in Spain. I was like, very young at that time. Uh, we we immediately we became friends, and every time I've done a film, before uh, locking the cut, I I come to LA and show him the film, and 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 it was a big coincidence that the, they offered me to do the sequel for Jurassic World, and he was the composer of the first Jurassic World, so I call him and I say, okay, I guess we're gonna work together for the, after so many years being friends. And and I show him this film, and immediately he wanted to do it. He said, "I I I I want I want to I want to be part of this journey with you." Well, it's a marvelous picture, and I I can't thank you enough for all coming. Thank you so much. And thank you, James. <laughs>